While I was busy at work, an unexpected email interrupted my day. It was from my husband Jack, who calmly confessed over the phone that he had fallen in love with someone else and was planning to start a new life with her. Shockingly, he also mentioned his intention to take the luxury camper van that we had recently bought a purchase made in my name through a loan. Despite my efforts to reason with him, Jack disregarded my pleas, abruptly ended the conversation, and soon became unreachable. Eventually, he vanished with his new partner, leaving me and our 12-year-old son, Gary, burdened with a significant debt. My name is Lauren, a 40-year-old mother, navigating through life with Gary, a remarkably bright child who loves to read and discuss complex topics. Unlike Gary, Jack has always been unpredictable, rarely holding on to a job for long. Despite these challenges, he managed to keep a stable income for the past four years, which brought a sense of relief to our family's financial stability. Our family, despite its imperfections, had moments of joy and dreams of making lasting memories together. One of these dreams involved purchasing a $55,000 camper van to explore and create adventures as a family. Unfortunately, due to Jack's poor credit history, I had to secure the loan for the van under my name. The day we were supposed to celebrate the van's arrival, I was blindsided by Jack's email, in which he claimed the van for himself, citing the loan was in my name and I would be responsible for its repayments. This abrupt revelation, followed by his confession of love for another woman, left me in a state of shock and uncertainty. At 40, with a son to raise and a sudden financial burden, I found myself pondering our future, unsure of the next steps to take in this unexpected turn of events. What started as a fleeting connection unexpectedly grew serious, prompting Jack to declare his intentions to start anew with someone else and leave our shared life behind. During a brief and unsettling phone call, he referenced our previous discussions about divorce conversations that emerged during heated arguments. Jack stated he would proceed with the divorce, swiftly ending the conversation and leaving me in a state of shock. This moment was the stark realization of Jack's betrayal, a harsh revelation that hit me deeply. Despite my attempts to reach out to him following this exchange, he remained silent, never responding to my calls or emails. Upon returning home one day, I discovered the drawer where we kept important documents, including our discussed divorce papers, was empty. Jack had taken them. This left me facing the immense financial strain of a $55,000 car loan we had taken together. Amidst this turmoil, my son Gary noticed my distress. His worry became evident one evening when he approached me, his voice laced with concern, asking if I was okay, noting my lack of appetite and the unusual atmosphere at home. Caught off guard by his perceptiveness, I realized I could no longer shield him from the truth. Hesitantly, I opened up to Gary, sharing the painful details of what had transpired. His response was surprisingly mature. He seemed to have anticipated the changes in our family dynamics, although I sensed the news affected him more than he let on. Inwardly, I apologized to him, feeling a profound sadness for the upheaval in his young life. As the days passed, the weight of the situation took a toll on me, both emotionally and physically. My health began to decline, a fact I could no longer ignore when I found myself unable to stand during a training session at work. Despite my attempts to reassure my colleagues, I collapsed, my body succumbing to the overwhelming stress. When I awoke, I was in a hospital room, a stark reminder of the toll the ordeal had taken on me. Amidst the physical and emotional chaos, the support from those around me, especially Gary, became a beacon of strength, reminding me of the resilience needed to navigate through the aftermath of Jack's departure and the challenges that lay ahead. After receiving a concerning diagnosis from the doctor, I was admitted to the hospital for further tests. There, lying in the hospital bed, hooked up to an IV drip and staring at the stark white ceiling, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the situation. It was supposed to be stress from emotional turmoil, 
Yet there I was, feeling utterly defeated. As tears began to flow, my son Gary, who usually maintains his composure, burst into the room, his face etched with worry. His sudden appearance prompted me to quickly dry my eyes. Mom, what's going on? It's not serious, is it? You're not going to leave me, are you? He asked, his voice laced with fear. Of course not, sweetheart. I could never leave you, I reassured him, attempting to mask my own fears. Gary explained how he had been notified by his school teacher about my hospitalization, how shocked and scared he had been. Despite his maturity, he was still just a 12-year-old boy, a realization that steeled my resolve to recover. However, my health situation was more grave than I initially thought. Diagnosed with a serious illness, the doctor recommended immediate surgery. Following the doctor's advice, I underwent the procedure, and a month passed before I was discharged a month since Jack had left us. Upon returning home, I found a demand letter for the car loan payment in the mailbox, a payment that should have been automatically deducted from my account. In a panic, I checked our finances, only to discover that our account, which previously held $30,000, was now almost empty, with just $55.90 remaining. It was clear to me, Jack was responsible. The urge to confront him and demand the money back surged through me, but he was unreachable, and without the camper van he took, selling it to recover the funds wasn't an option. The realization that Jack had not only taken the van, but also drained our savings hit me hard. Physically weakened and financially devastated, I felt utterly helpless. Gary, sensing my despair, offered a comforting touch, his hand on my forehead. You look pale, Mom. Are you okay? His innocence and concern were touching, yet it pained me to admit the reality. Physically, I might be fine, Gary, but your father took more than just the car, he took all our savings too. I can't work right now because of my health, and we're out of money. I just don't know what we're going to do. I confessed, the weight of our predicament pressing down on me. Despite the challenges, Gary's unwavering support provided a glimmer of hope. Together, we faced an uncertain future, but his resilience reminded me of the strength we shared as a family, even in the darkest of times. Motivated by my son's determination, I found myself pulling away from the grip of despair. I see, then I'll find some work too. I declared, bolstered by my 12-year-old son's resolve, to contribute by delivering newspapers and looking for work online. It wasn't the time to feel defeated. Sorry for worrying you, Gary. I can't let myself be weakened by this. I'll shift my mindset and do everything in our power, I said, offering him a reassuring smile. Gary's smile mirrored mine, and then he proposed something wholly unexpected. Let's figure out a way to get the camper van back from Dad. How can we do that? He asked with a spark of resolve in his eyes. Yes, the camper van is registered in my name. But what can we do about that? I pondered aloud, intrigued by his line of thinking. Gary then shared an idea so innovative it took me by surprise, an idea I hadn't considered. Despite not knowing Jack's whereabouts, Gary suggested we use technology at our fingertips. Recalling a family hiking trip where we had felt lost, we had bought Gary a kid's cell phone equipped with a GPS app accessible by both Jack and me. With this app, Gary believed we could track Jack's location in real time, a thought that hadn't crossed my mind. But what if we confront him and he manages to evade us again? I questioned, skeptical of our chances in such a scenario. Don't worry, I've taken some precautions, Gary said, his smile widening with confidence. I was astonished by his foresight. While I was hospitalized, Gary had independently set a plan in motion, uncovering information about Jack's mistress and plotting our next steps with a maturity far beyond his years. All right, let's show Dad the consequences of his betrayal. I agreed, feeling a newfound strength with Gary by my side. Together, we prepared to face Jack, my son's intelligence and bravery filling me with pride. With Gary by my side, I feel invincible. 
Let's do this, I thought to myself, ready for whatever lay ahead. Two days later, my phone rang. It was Jack, sounding desperate. Ah, it's me, I need your help. The police are questioning me about you, and they might ask me to come to the station voluntarily. Please help me, he pleaded. Oh, is that so? Just wait a moment, I replied, maintaining my composure. Gary and I quickly headed to the location provided, a forest park near our house known for camping. There we found Jack being interrogated by the police beside his car, his expression a mix of confusion and dismay. The tables had turned. With careful planning and the element of surprise on our side, we were ready to face Jack and reclaim what was rightfully ours, standing united and stronger than ever. I took a deep breath and requested some privacy from the police, suggesting that Jack and I needed a moment to discuss matters privately. With an air of discomfort, heightened by the watchful eyes of bystanders, Jack hastily ushered Gary and me into the car. Inside, we were greeted by the sight of Jack's mistress, sitting with an air of defiance, but her presence was the least of our concerns at that moment. Sorry for the inconvenience, and thank you for coming, but why did the police show up? I'm confused, Jack started, genuinely puzzled by the turn of events. The reason is simple. I reported the camper van as missing because, in essence, it was stolen, I explained calmly, despite the absurdity of Jack's logic that presumed marital disputes excluded criminal activities. But we're married, how can it be stolen? Jack argued, not grasping the gravity of his actions. I reminded him, you filed for divorce, remember? That means, legally, we're no longer a couple but strangers. Taking a vehicle without the owner's consent is theft. It was Gary, with his sharp understanding, who pieced everything together, prompting a weak justification from Jack that he had only borrowed the van temporarily. Well, I need my car back now. Handing over the keys would be very helpful, I said, extending my hand towards Jack, who, albeit reluctantly, complied. It was then that Gary, in his straightforward manner, questioned his father's decision to abandon his family for another woman. Caught off guard, Jack fumbled for words, only to be interrupted by his mistress's boastful claim of being the more attractive choice, which she believed justified Jack's departure. Gary's stern rebuke silenced her, turning the focus back on Jack for an explanation. When Jack hesitated, Gary threatened to involve the police again, prompting a hurried admission. Jack revealed that Martha, the other woman, had joined his company five months prior, and their affair began shortly after. The revelation of Martha's pregnancy led Jack to the decision to leave us and start anew with her. Why did you take the camper van? I asked, aiming to understand the rationale behind his decision amidst the chaos of his actions and decisions. After leaving my job, I contemplated selling the camper van for some extra cash. However, it seemed you had other plans, Jack, using it for your escapades. I figured it was too hasty to sell it immediately, so we took it for a trip instead. But how did you keep track of all this? Jack asked, puzzled. I reminded him of the little safeguard we put in place after Gary's fox misadventure during a family hike. Remember, we bought Gary a child's phone and installed a GPS tracking app. You seem to have forgotten we installed the same app on your phone. So I've been aware of your whereabouts all along. To my surprise, Gary later confessed he had orchestrated getting lost on that hike as a ploy to secure a phone for himself, a revelation that highlighted his cunning and foresight. I had my suspicions about Dad so I devised this plan to keep an eye on him, Gary admitted, showcasing his adeptness at strategy. You're quite the formidable child, Gary. I strive never to be the kind of adult who betrays those who matter, without a second thought, Jack said, a trace of realization in his tone. Confronted by the blunt truth from his son, Jack appeared defeated, a stark contrast to the empowered feeling Gary's assertiveness and maturity instilled in me. As a mother, this bolstered my resolve to ensure everything was settled justly. 
and about the $30,000 you took from our account. I pressed on, that money needs to be returned immediately. It was our family savings. Jack protested, but we were married. I don't have to give it back. That's where you're wrong. The money was mine, saved painstakingly from before we were even together. Your history of quitting jobs never really contributed to our savings, did it? I countered, dismayed yet vindicated to learn how the money was frivolously wasted by Jack and his mistress. It was a moment that cemented my relief over our impending divorce. So this is how it stands. If you appropriated the van and my savings for your use, that's a criminal offense, I informed him, ready to address the matter legally if necessary. Jack, trying to dismiss the severity, retorted, I've already sent the police away. It's not their concern anymore, right? I only agreed we would have a discussion. This encounter underscored the stark realities and the necessity of standing firm, ensuring that justice was served for the sake of our family's future and dignity. In the midst of our confrontation, I made it clear that retracting the complaint was out of the question. In fact, I was determined to add the theft of my money to the existing report. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Gary, ever so ready, offered to contact the police immediately using a quick feature on his child's phone. Martha, who had been silently observing our heated exchange from within the confines of the camper van, attempted a swift exit but was met with a startling surprise. Outside, her parents awaited, their expressions a vivid display of rage and disappointment. Her attempt to leave was halted by their presence, and her apologies were drowned out by their furious reprimands. Why are you here? How did you find out? Martha stammered, caught off guard. I took the liberty of contacting your parents in advance, I revealed. This turn of events was made possible by Gary's initiative. During my hospitalization, he had visited Jack's workplace to share our distressing situation. Moved by Gary's genuine distress, Jack's colleagues connected the dots to Martha, leading to the discovery of her parents' address. Jack and Martha's overly familiar behavior had not gone unnoticed at the office, further fueled by compromising photos from the company's welcoming party for new employees. With this information and Martha's known commute from her parents' house, I sought out her parents, shared the ordeal we were enduring, and arranged for them to be present at this pivotal moment. Martha's frustration was palpable as she accused me of betrayal to which I retorted with my own grievances. The conversation took an unexpected turn when I commented on Martha's noticeably pregnant state, questioning the due date of the baby she was expecting in five months. This revelation brought the timeline into sharp focus, revealing a glaring discrepancy with the duration of her relationship with Jack. Caught off guard, Jack could only stare in disbelief as the realization dawned upon him. The child Martha was carrying could not possibly be his, given the timeline of their affair. This revelation exposed not just the infidelity, but also the deception Martha had orchestrated. Caught in her web of lies, Martha's facade crumbled as she nearly confessed to her deceit. Jack, now faced with the truth, was forced to confront the consequences of his actions and the reality that the life he thought he was building on a foundation of lies was crumbling before his eyes. Caught in the midst of deception, Jack's frustration boiled over as he accused Martha of ruining his life with her lies. You're so gullible, not seeing through the lies at all. A real fool, he exclaimed, as their argument spiraled into an ugly exchange. Amidst their quarrel, we reached out to the police to update them on the unfolding drama. As night fell, the forest park was illuminated by the eerie glow of police car lights, setting a dramatic scene for the conclusion of this ordeal. In a moment of desperation, Jack pleaded for forgiveness, acknowledging his wrongdoings and vowing never to stray again. However, Gary, wise beyond his years, dismissed his father's sudden change of heart with a dose of reality. People don't change overnight especially not someone as unreliable as you. Echoing Gary's sentiment, I made it clear to Jack that I could not trust his hollow promises. 
it's time for you to face the consequences of your actions at the police station. As for the money, worry about repaying it after you've served your time, I told him firm in my resolve. Jack worried about his ability to repay the stolen funds if incarcerated, but I assured him that arrangements would be made. Once you're out, you'll work off your debt, including the $30,000 you took and child support for Gary. We'll calculate the total amount out, I explained, already having a plan in place for his employment and repayment. Turning to Martha, I reminded her of her role in this debacle. You might consider yourself merely a bystander, but you're complicit in Jack's actions. Be ready to face the consequences. Her plea for help from her parents was met with rejection. They could not support a daughter who brought trouble upon others. Eventually, Jack and Martha were taken into custody, a testament to Gary's strategic thinking. Although they were released from detention shortly thereafter, they were confronted with a substantial financial obligation to me, arranged through legal channels. I successfully claimed $30,000 in damages and secured a child support agreement from Jack amounting to $800 monthly for Gary. Furthermore, I facilitated Jack's employment at a subcontracting factory associated with my workplace, ensuring his debts to us would be deducted directly from his earnings. With the camper van sold and the loan settled, my health saw a significant improvement, rejuvenating my energy and dedication to my work. Gary, too, took on more responsibilities around the house, embodying resilience and perseverance. Together, we look forward to moving ahead, stronger and more united than ever, ensuring Gary has every opportunity to follow his dreams without hindrance. My name's Julia, and I'm 30 years old. I work at a company that creates designs for printed materials like flyers and catalogs. Despite everything going digital these days, I find my job designing for various businesses incredibly fulfilling. Whenever clients tell me they loved how a design turned out, especially for something like a Christmas event, it really makes my day. You could say this job is my passion, and there was a time I thought it might just be me and my career for life. One day, while I was mulling over this idea, my dad had to be rushed to the hospital because his appendix was acting up. That's where I met James, the kind doctor who greeted me. At that time, he was just another face in the hospital, asking if I was there to visit someone. Little did I know, James would become a huge part of my life, first as my boyfriend and now my fiancé. It's funny how life works. You find the most significant changes in the most unexpected places. Even though I always say my job is my top priority, I caught myself getting super excited about marriage, flipping through wedding magazines the moment the topic comes up. I guess I'm really looking forward to this new chapter. But not everyone seems happy about my happiness. My sister, for instance, has always had this way of looking down on me, and now on James too. It's like the more content I became, the more upset she got. It's strange seeing her face change over time, from the cute sister I once knew to someone who always seems angry. Her attitude made me incredibly frustrated, pushing my patience beyond its limits. This whole situation makes me wonder why people who only know how to belittle others often end up with such bitterness etched on their faces. It's as if their outer appearance begins to reflect the negativity they carry inside. Meanwhile, I'm just here, trying to navigate my way through life, finding joy in my work, and now, in my engagement to James. Life is full of surprises, and I'm learning to embrace them, one day at a time. While I was enjoying a quiet afternoon, sipping tea in our living room and flipping through magazines, an unexpected interruption occurred. My sister, Emily, who is three years my junior, snatched the magazine right out of my hands. To my surprise, it was a bridal magazine I was looking at, and Emily couldn't help but question why I was interested in such a thing. I tried to brush it off, telling her it was none of her business, but Emily always had a way of making everything about her. Emily has always been quite upfront, especially about her dating life, proudly stating she's never been single. She launched into stories about her current boyfriend, 
even though no one asked. It's been the same ever since we were kids. Emily, with her charming looks, was everyone's favorite. She grew up spoiled, constantly affirmed by our parents and everyone else, which made her believe she was the center of the universe. This attitude led her to look down on me, treating me as if I was beneath her. Don't stand too close. I don't want people to think we're alike. She'd say, or, why bother studying? It's not like you'll get better grades. Her arrogance knew no bounds, constantly flaunting her popularity and assuming I was envious. Even when our parents tried to correct her behavior, it was as if Emily's arrogance was set in stone. She never missed a chance to belittle me, a routine that became the backdrop of our relationship. But one day, I'd had enough. As she went on about her latest boyfriend, I calmly revealed that I too had someone in my life. In fact, we were engaged in planning our wedding, which is why I was looking at bridal magazines. Emily was taken aback, skepticism written all over her face. She mocked, doubting anyone could truly appreciate me. But when she questioned what my fiancé could possibly see in me, I confidently responded that he was drawn to my optimism and cheerfulness. Her disbelief only grew, suggesting he must see me more as a caretaker than a partner. Yet, despite her harsh words, I knew the truth of my worth and the genuine love my fiancé and I shared, something Emily's cynicism couldn't tarnish. In my determination to maintain my career post-marriage, I hope to convey to my fiancé that being the perfect housewife wasn't in my plans. This revelation led to an exaggerated response from my sister, Emily, who seemed shocked at the idea of me working after getting married. Are you marrying someone without money? She quipped, implying that my future husband must be struggling financially for me to continue working. Her insinuation irritated me, but I clarified that money wasn't the issue. My fiancé James was a doctor with a stable income, I simply wanted to pursue my career. My sister fell silent after my comeback, muttering something under her breath as I walked away, feeling a mix of annoyance and satisfaction. The next step in our marriage preparation was introducing James to my family. The atmosphere was warm and welcoming until Emily made her appearance, dramatically altering the vibe. She complimented James on his looks, canceling her plans to meet him, despite my hope she'd be absent. My history with Emily made me anxious. She had a track record of luring away my boyfriends during our school days. Though we were now adults, and I hadn't dated much since then, her sudden interest in James brought back old fears. However, I tried to convince myself that Emily had grown up and wouldn't attempt anything with my fiancé. Despite my hopes, seeing Emily and James interact with what appeared to be a blush from James filled me with dread, and then my worst nightmare unfolded. James announced he wanted to call off our engagement, having fallen for Emily, who claimed it was inevitable since James found her more attractive. She brazenly justified her actions, stating James had passionately proposed to her, declaring it a crime to be as charming as she was. Next to her, James, my now ex fiance laughed off the situation, expressing regret for not realizing sooner how cute my sister was. This turn of events was a harsh reminder of the pattern that seemed destined to repeat itself, no matter how much I hoped it wouldn't. Emily's lack of remorse and James's cavalier attitude left me in a state of shock and heartbreak, showcasing a betrayal I had never anticipated. Realizing the truth about James's feelings and his ease in shifting affections to my sister left me with a profound sense of relief. The moment I saw his insincere smile, any affection I had for him disappeared completely leaving behind only a feeling of revulsion. I found myself grateful for the breakup, appreciating that I discovered his true nature before we were married. I'm actually relieved I didn't marry someone who could switch his affections so easily. Consider him a parting gift, I told my sister, genuinely content with the outcome. My sister and James mistook my sincerity for bitterness, accusing me of being a sore loser. But it wasn't about losing. It was about recognizing I deserved better. 
Their inability to see beyond their shallow victory made me realize any further interaction was pointless. Interacting with you is a waste of my time. Goodbye. Their taunts of me being a sore loser followed me out, but their words didn't sting me if anything. They confirmed my decision to move on was the right one. Afterward, our paths never crossed again, partly thanks to our parents, who, outraged by their behavior, cut ties with them. I heard they married, but by then, it no longer mattered to me. Five years later, at 35, I remained dedicated to my career, finding satisfaction in my work. It was during this time that I met Gary, a client who grew to appreciate my works so much that he began requesting me specifically. Our professional relationship gradually became personal, and soon, he was asking me to dinner, and then on a date. Eventually, Gary proposed, and I was genuinely happy. He was sincere and kind, a stark contrast to my past experience with James. However, the shadow of my previous engagement lingered, making me cautious. I decided to be honest with Gary, sharing the story of my sister and my ex fiancé even showing him a picture of my sister to gauge his reaction. Gary simply glanced at the photo before turning away with a disinterested look, offering me a reassuring smile instead. I've met plenty of people considered attractive, but none of them moved me. I used to think maybe I'd end up alone because of that. But meeting you changed my mind. It's not about external beauty, it's the inner beauty that matters. And that's what I see in you, Julia, he explained. His words made me pause, surprised and touched. What do you mean? I asked, seeking clarity. Gary smiled. In my line of work, I've learned to see beyond appearances. No matter how beautiful or charming someone might be, it's the beauty inside that truly counts. That's what drew me to you. You're the person I've been searching for. Hearing this, I felt a deep sense of relief and validation. Gary's understanding and perspective were exactly what I needed to hear, helping to heal the wounds left by my past experiences. His words reassured me that not everyone would betray trust as my sister and James had, and that genuine connections, based on real appreciation and respect, were possible. During a conversation about work, Gary shared with me how he found my enthusiasm and joy for life truly captivating. He described me as bright and beautiful, saying my happiness was evident and that it made me shine. I couldn't help but feel embarrassed by his words, telling him to stop because it was just too much for me. But Gary, undeterred, continued to express his admiration, insisting that I was more charming and beautiful than anyone else he'd ever met. He was sincere in his desire for us to start dating with the intention of marriage. Despite my protests that it was too embarrassing, his compliments didn't cease, even after we agreed to date. Eventually, Gary and I got married, and our life together has been wonderful. We've grown even closer than before, sharing household responsibilities and enjoying our time together especially on days off when we'd explore new places or check out furniture for our home. One day, while looking at furniture, I encountered someone from my past, my sister Emily, accompanied by my ex fiance James. Emily's appearance had changed. Her features seemed more severe, perhaps a reflection of her age or the deepening of her personality. James, who was smirking beside her, looked like he had lost some weight. Their presence was unexpected, and Emily's voice was unmistakable as she remarked on my appearance, insinuating that I looked plain. Their condescending attitude hadn't changed, with Emily implying that the store's upscale and imported furniture wasn't meant for people like me. James echoed her sentiments, suggesting my presence might lower the store's reputation, and hinted it was best if I left to avoid any confusion about their financial status. This encounter was a stark reminder of the past, but it also highlighted the stark contrast between my current, fulfilling life with Gary and the superficiality I had left behind. Despite their attempt to belittle me, I found their attitudes more pitiful than hurtful, knowing the depth of love and respect in my own marriage was something they could not understand or diminish. 
The harsh and condescending words from my sister and her husband were trying, but I knew engaging with them was pointless. Their loud critiques about my supposed financial status began drawing unwanted attention from others in the store. Frustrated and ready to leave, I tried to pull my husband, Gary, away, but he stood firm, catching the notice of my sister and her husband for the first time. Who's this? My sister demanded, surprised to learn that Gary was my husband. Her reaction was a mix of shock and mockery, questioning why he would marry someone plain like me and jokingly asking if he was in need of a maid. She bragged about her comfortable life, dining out frequently and hiring housekeeping, implying that Gary and I were less fortunate for needing to work. My sister's patronizing tone and her extension of her sentences in a particularly annoying manner only fueled my frustration. She gloated over stealing my previous fiancé, suggesting Gary and I were doomed to a life of hardship and mocking us for being a perfect match in her eyes. The insults towards me were bearable, but the moment she disparaged my husband, my patience snapped. I was ready to confront her, but Gary calmly stepped in front of me, introducing himself as my husband. Despite their dismissive reaction to his name, Gary remained polite and even offered his business card to James. This gesture seemed to momentarily pause the conversation as James glanced at the card, but my sister's attitude remained unchanged, continuing to belittle me as if it were a truth universally acknowledged. In this moment, Gary's composure and the dignified way he handled the situation made me realize the stark contrast between the shallow, materialistic values my sister held and the genuine, respectful love and partnership I shared with Gary. His calmness in the face of their provocation underscored the strength and depth of our relationship, highlighting that true value lies not in outward appearances or material wealth, but in character and integrity. Gary, always the picture of politeness, didn't shy away from confronting my sister's rudeness with a cunning clarity. To judge someone as ugly based on looks alone is shallow. But if we're talking about ugliness, yours stems from within, from a personality that delights in belittling others, he said calmly, his words slicing through the air with precision. My sister, so often unflappable in her self-assuredness, found herself blushing deeply, outraged at the suggestion she might be the one at fault. Ugly? Me? How so? She sputtered, genuinely thrown off by the accusation. A truly beautiful person doesn't feel the need to overshadow or harm their sibling. Could it be that your actions towards Julia stem from jealousy, from a desire to surpass someone you actually admire? Gary proposed, unsettling her further. The thought had never crossed my mind that my sister's constant competitiveness and cruelty could be rooted in anything other than disdain. But seeing her reaction, I couldn't help but reconsider the dynamics of our relationship. Gary continued, suggesting that envy was the real motive behind my sister's actions. Taking what belongs to someone else isn't just theft, it's a clear sign of envy. It indicates a struggle with self-worth and confidence. A truly confident person wouldn't need to assert their superiority by diminishing others. My sister tried to defend herself against Gary's observations, but her rebuttals grew weaker, her usual bravado fading. It was then that James, pale and noticeably shaken, intervened. He had been quietly observing, flipping the business card Gary had given him back and forth, his unease growing. Suddenly, he grasped my sister, demanding in a troubled voice, What's happening? Who is this man? The business card a seemingly innocuous piece of paper, had become the catalyst for a shift in the air, prompting questions and revealing the undercurrents of insecurity and rivalry that had long defined my sister's actions. It was a moment of revelation, showing that beneath the surface of her confident exterior lay a complex web of emotions, and perhaps a begrudging respect for me that she herself had not fully acknowledged. I remembered the name sounded familiar so I did a bit of digging, and then it clicked, Gary Henry. So, what about it? My sister asked, confused. 
That's the name of the hospital I work at, I said, a realization dawning on her face. A hospital, she echoed, still not putting the pieces together. Yes, Henry Medical Association, I clarified, watching her face change as she connected the dots. He's Dr. Henry's son, the director and head of the hospital, she stammered, disbelief in her tone. She tried to dismiss it as a coincidence, citing the commonality of the surname. But I knew for sure. I seen him at the hospital with the director. I didn't recognize him at first because I only saw him from afar, but now it's clear, I admitted. My sister speculated that Gary must be a doctor too, given his father's profession, but the business card he handed over told a different story. It was then that Gary humbly revealed the truth to my stunned sister and James. Not every doctor's son follows in his footsteps. And this company, he gestured to the business card, is a well-known pharmaceutical company recently passed down to me from my grandfather. My sister was at a loss for words and James, realizing the gravity of the situation, attempted to sit up straighter, both of them turning pale as the significance of Gary's identity sank in. Gary continued, calmly disclosing how he knew of their past mistreatment towards me, stating that their behavior was far worse than he had imagined. James tried to muster an explanation, his face ashen, but Gary, with a stern look, silenced him. There's no excuse for such behavior. I'll be informing my father of this, Gary warned, leaving James to contemplate the repercussions of his actions. As we turned to leave, James was visibly shaken, and my sister stood frozen, still trying to process the sudden turn of events. Walking away from them, I felt a sense of closure, knowing that the truth had finally come to light and the respect and integrity Gary carried with him had revealed the true character of those who had wronged me. Leaving my sister and her husband behind, I felt a chapter of my life closing. I couldn't help but wonder what became of them after that confrontation. James faced consequences at work for his poor attitude towards colleagues and patients alike. His salary was cut, and he was demoted, leading to a swift exit from the hospital as gossip about his behavior made rounds. Struggling to secure a new position, his life became markedly more difficult. My sister, on the other hand, had always lived beyond her means, relying on James's income which was never enough to satisfy her spending habits. James's financial downturn and subsequent weight loss were a stark testament to their dire situation. Quickly losing interest in him after his demotion, she divorced James, convinced she could easily move on to someone else. However, the reality was far from what she had envisioned. No longer the young, charming girl, her harsher demeanor had become evident, diminishing her appeal and leaving her lamenting her lack of suitors. She sought solace and sympathy from our parents, bemoaning her sudden lack of attention and even envying my life hinting at a deep-seated rivalry and admiration she might have felt towards me all along. Despite her cries for help, our parents stood firm, advising her to face the consequences of her actions, leading her into an uncertain future away from our family's support. As for me, distanced from the tumultuous relationship with my sister and her husband, I found solace in a peaceful, fulfilling life with Gary. Together, we looked forward to welcoming a new member to our family, a beacon of hope and joy amidst the remnants of past conflicts. As I caressed my growing belly, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the tranquility and love that surrounded me, a stark contrast to the turmoil that once defined my relationships with those closest to me. At a family gathering, my stepmother threw coffee on my dad's face as soon as I mentioned my father's job at the factory. She laughed uncontrollably while doing it. My stepfather watched without saying a word. The coffee stain spread across the suit my dad had cleaned just for this day. Thankfully, the coffee was only lukewarm, so there was no risk of burns. I was shocked but quickly handed a napkin to my dad. Henry, my boyfriend, was panicking as he tried to clean my dad's suit. He couldn't stop himself from laughing at his parents' ridiculous behavior. During this chaos, my dad just stood up, pointed at them, and sternly said he would ruin their company. 
This was a tone I had never heard him use before. He took my hand, and we started to leave the Hamilton Hill household. Henry scolded his parents and hurried after us, apologizing. He promised his parents would say sorry later, but my dad dismissed it, saying we were done with them. My name is Olivia Wilde, a 29-year-old office worker. My dad raised me alone after my mom died when I was little. He ran the factory and always made time for my school events, often rushing back to work afterward. I admired him immensely for that dedication. In college, I dated Henry, who was four years older than me. He was a gentle, sincere, and polite guy, well-liked at school. He accepted my feelings, and we started dating. Although he hinted at issues with his parents, he never went into details, and I didn't press him. Henry had been living on his own since college, though he visited his parents occasionally and always seemed worn out afterward. When Henry first met my dad, despite his family troubles, he always prioritized me, and that made me proud of him. I was eager to see how my dad and Henry would get along, so I planned to introduce them. It was a mix of nervousness and excitement when we unexpectedly ran into my dad during a date. Oh, dad! aren't you supposed to be at work today? What's going on? I asked. Ah, Olivia, is that you? I'm just coming back from a client meeting. And who is this? He replied. This is Henry Hamilton Hill. We're dating, I said. My dad has a serious look that can be intimidating, but he isn't really stern. Henry was quite nervous when he met my dad for the first time. He bowed deeply and said, nice to meet you. I'm Henry Hamilton Hill. I'm honored to be dating Olivia. My dad smiled warmly at Henry's respectful greeting and started chatting with him. So you're Olivia's boyfriend? Don't be so nervous. Take good care of her, okay? Yes, I'll do my best. Thank you, Henry replied. As they continued talking, Henry became more relaxed and they seemed to get along well. I was relieved to see the three important men in my life connecting. I had worried about whether my dad would like Henry. We couldn't stay long since my dad had to return to work, so after saying goodbye, I turned to Henry, who seemed a bit dazed. I asked if something was wrong, and he suddenly got excited. That was really your dad, right? He asked, which puzzled me. Yes, that's my dad. Why? What's up? I replied. Henry just crossed his arms and seemed lost in thought. Curious, I asked him what he was thinking about so intensely. It's nothing big, just wondering, he said vaguely, which left me feeling uneasy. He dodged any more questions about it. Although he said he liked my dad, I started to worry whether he really did. This concern stayed with me until a few days later when Henry called me for an important talk. Nervous about our last meeting with my dad, I went to the cafe where we planned to meet. Seeing Henry's gloomy face through the glass as I walked in only deepened my anxiety, but I decided to stay cheerful as I greeted him. I slowly walked over to Henry, who was deeply sighing. I gently tapped him on the shoulder, surprising him. Whoa, Olivia, you scared me, he exclaimed, holding his chest and widening his eyes as he saw me. I was taken aback by how jumpy he was. He seemed really troubled. Sitting across from Henry, who still looked gloomy, I ordered from the waiter. My anxiety increased as his expression stayed down. I really wanted him to share what was on his mind, so I spoke up. Hey Henry, what's bothering you so much? Is there something wrong with my dad? I asked. Henry quickly looked up and immediately shook his head. Absolutely not. I actually respect your dad. It's just my... My... He trailed off and looked down again. I sighed, feeling like I needed to pull the words out of him. If you're worried about something, I want to know. What's on your mind? I urged him. Henry took a deep breath, as if deciding to open up, and then began to talk. There's something I need to tell you about my parents. It's a bit of a long story, but I need you to hear it all, he said. The story Henry shared was quite shocking. He told me that his parents are very judgmental, always looking at people's education and jobs. They've been very controlling in his life, even going as far as to rudely dismiss any girlfriend he introduced right away, 
which always ended with the girls breaking up with him in tears. That's why Henry was hesitant about our relationship, especially about introducing me to his parents. But I reassured him, don't worry, we don't need to involve your parents much in our marriage. We can just handle the wedding formalities and that's it. My dad seems to like you, so what's the problem? It's okay, my dad liked you, so there's nothing to worry about. Really? That makes me happy, Henry responded, a smile breaking through his worries. When I first met your dad, I was surprised by how different he is from my own parents. I thought about how marrying Olivia would make me the son of such a great man, but it also means my parents become your parents, and I wasn't sure about that. I perked up when you said your dad liked me, but then I sighed deeply again. However, I had an idea and looked up, apologizing. When we go meet my parents for our marriage, can we have your dad come too? I want them to see that there are respectable people like him. It might not change them right away, but I hope it helps. Okay, I'll talk to my dad about it, but I wish you had approached this differently, I said. Oh, sorry, I'll do it properly from now, Henry replied, suddenly realizing he should have proposed in a more traditional way. After receiving Henry's proposal, I decided to talk to my father about joining us when meeting Henry's parents. Initially hesitant, my dad agreed when Henry formally asked for my hand in marriage. We then set a date to meet his parents. On the day, dressed up and standing at Henry's family home's front door, I was understandably nervous after hearing all the stories. My dad tried to lighten the mood, laughing and encouraging us, no need to be so tense. Henry's parents are just overly concerned. Be confident. His reassurance helped calm my nerves a bit. At the door, Henry rang the bell, but there was no sound. Wondering if they weren't home, he rang again with no answer. Not wanting to make a bad impression in front of my dad, Henry excused himself and went inside first. My father and I exchanged worried glances and waited quietly. Soon, Henry came out looking flustered. Before I could ask what was wrong, he put on a forced smile and said, Sorry for the delay. Please wait a bit longer, we'll be ready soon. Then he went back inside. My dad sighed in exasperation, and I felt increasingly anxious. This incident could even jeopardize our wedding plans. My father isn't short-tempered, but he really dislikes dishonesty. I was worried about the worst-case scenario as we waited outside. Finally, Henry came out and awkwardly invited us inside. His parents were waiting for us, but they seemed odd. His mother had a sly grin, and his father looked away, uninterested. We were led to the living room, where the coffee served was hastily made and lukewarm. The whole situation made me uneasy, but I decided to continue with the introductions. Henry, trying to regain his composure, introduced my dad and me. Although Henry's introduction was warm and thoughtful, his parents sneered at us. Suddenly, his mother grabbed a coffee cup, and as soon as she spoke about calling off the engagement, she splashed coffee on my dad. My father-in-law, who was smiling and giggling next to her, didn't scold her. The coffee stain quickly spread on the suit my dad had cleaned for the day. Luckily, the coffee was lukewarm, so there was no risk of burns. Shocked, I handed my dad a handkerchief while Henry frantically tried to wipe off the suit, worried about any potential injuries. Henry's parents just laughed in response. My dad, however, remained calm. He stood up, pointed at them, and declared he would ruin their company. He spoke in a tone I had never heard before, took my hand, and we left the Hamilton Hill house. Henry scolded his parents and then quickly followed us. I'm really sorry. I'll have my parents apologize later, Henry said to my dad, who gravely replied, no need. We're done with them anyway, as he patted Henry on the shoulder. We went back to our house, and my dad immediately changed his clothes. Meanwhile, Henry was earnestly apologizing outside my dad's room. I could hear my dad's troubled voice occasionally but I was too shocked by Henry's parents' behavior to pay much attention. I knew getting along with Henry's parents would be tough, but I never expected them to act so rudely. 
furious at how they insulted my dad. I sat on the living room sofa, clenching my fists and replaying the event in my mind. It wasn't helping, but I couldn't stop myself. When my dad finished changing, he and Henry came into the living room. Henry immediately started apologizing to me, almost bowing. Olivia, I'm really sorry. I never expected them to do such a thing, especially to insult your dad. I'm truly sorry. What happened was terrible, Henry said. He was sincere and didn't even ask for forgiveness, showing he knew it wasn't easily forgivable. Seeing his earnest apology, I realized I had to apologize too. I took Henry's hand as he knelt and said, I'm sorry too. I should not have suggested meeting without knowing everything. I didn't expect things to turn out this way. Then, I turned to my dad and apologized from the bot Henry of my heart. Dad, I'm sorry this happened because of my thoughtless suggestion. My dad just looked down, troubled and shrugged his shoulders. It was hard for him to say anything. None of us expected this to happen, but that meant my dad's threat was serious. I decided to ask him about it. Dad, was what you said true? Are you really going to ruin their company? I asked. My dad glanced at Henry, then nodded firmly. Yes, it's true. I'm going to ruin their company. Their business was already struggling, so I've been thinking about what to do. This seems like a good opportunity to cut ties, my dad stated, his eyes showing unwavering determination. He runs an industrial company and is the CEO. His company is a top local enterprise where he serves as both the factory manager and CEO. He started as a worker in this factory and gave up his dream of becoming a painter to raise me alone after my mom passed away. He worked tirelessly, and his hard work led to several promotions. Eventually, he caught the attention of the former CEO, who chose my dad as his successor when he retired. The company has expanded, owning various subsidiaries, one of which is managed by Henry's father, my father-in-law. We discovered this during our recent visit. Ideally, my father-in-law should have realized this, but he didn't, due to the premature actions of Henry's mother. Henry just wanted to explain that his father worked for a subsidiary of my dad's company. However, his parents' prejudices prevented this from being clarified, leading to the current situation. If only his parents had listened. My father mentioned that his company was having some management problems, and he was thinking about what to do next. He mentioned layoffs might improve things, but he really wanted to avoid that. It's a good chance to decide which parts to downsize, he said with a troubled smile, clearly not wanting to fire any workers. You could tell he regretted even considering it. After a serious talk with my dad, Henry spoke to him quietly. I've decided to close it down, but that means your parents will be in trouble. It's harsh, but are you okay with that? Henry hesitated at first, then looked firmly at my father and replied, I've already cut ties with them. They did something unforgivable. Part of their consequence is dealing with their actions. More than that, I want them to think about what they've done, including this incident. But I have a request. I know it's awkward to ask now, but please, let me get engaged to Olivia. I know I've caused trouble because of my parents, but I want to be with her more than anything. Please forgive me. Moved by Henry's sincerity and despite the situation, I'd also pleaded with my dad, Please, dad, I know how things have turned out, but I want to be with Henry. After listening to us, my dad thought for a while, then seemed to resign himself. If you both feel the same, it's fine, but there's one condition. Your parents are company executives. I need to know what you plan to do with their employees. If you can't handle that, the marriage is off, he said and then sent Henry away, not even looking at me before he went back to his room. A few days later, Henry prepared a plan for the employees at his father's company. He arranged a meeting with my dad, and when I got home from work, they were discussing it. Henry had written down possible job placements for all the employees and was showing it to my dad, hoping he could employ them at his company. Henry expressed his desire to help with the transition and add energy to the business. I also selfishly want to work at your company. 
I'll work for free until everything is stable and we see results. I want to make up for any problems with my hard work, Henry said, bowing to my father. He seemed to feel partly responsible for his own company's problems and was determined to work hard to help resolve the situation. I just learned our marriage would be delayed, but it was a necessary delay. Welcome back, Olivia. I'm sorry for making such a big decision alone, but it wouldn't be fair if I were the only one happy, Henry explained. You're too selfish. Dad, please let me work at the company with Henry. I'll also work for free, and I want you to accept Henry's proposal, I said, despite Henry trying to stop me. I insisted firmly and begged my dad. While this was happening, my dad didn't say anything, but after repeated pleas, he uncrossed his arms and quietly nodded. Meanwhile, Henry's parents still hadn't apologized. My dad seemed to have been waiting for their apology for the past few days, but that time was up. Time's up, he muttered, starting to prepare to take over my father-in-law's company. Time passed, and the day came when the company collapsed. Henry's parents contacted us in protest, summoning us to their home. When we arrived, the place was crowded with people protesting the closure. They were all former employees, angry and shouting. It seemed Henry's father hadn't explained anything to them. By summoning us, it looked like his parents intended to blame us for their failure. As soon as they saw us, they pointed at us and started accusing. Look there, that's the root of all evil. It's not me. They're the ones who ruined the company, not me. Especially that woman. She seduced our son and ingratiated herself with her father. We are victims too, so stop complaining about it, they shouted. Others also criticized my father and me, trying to deflect attention from themselves. Despite the parents' wild accusations, Henry, visibly upset, tried to calm the former employees. Please wait, everyone. Yes, my father's company collapsed, but it's because of those three also. I want to help all of you who lost your jobs unfairly. Please listen to me. As Henry spoke, the chaos slowly calmed down and the former employees turned their attention to us. Henry called out each person's name, announcing their new job placements. Realizing they were not forgotten, the employees let out sighs of relief. After Henry announced everyone's placement, his parents started making a scene. Hey, Henry, what about us? Why are you ignoring us? We're victims too. Tell us our job placements. If you do, we might even forgive that man and allow your marriage to that woman, they complained. Ignoring his parents' outbursts, Henry began explaining how the company went bankrupt, a situation his own parents had caused. I apologize for the inconvenience caused to all of you, but thanks to a kind-hearted CEO, your jobs are secure. Please calm down and let's start fresh, Henry said. After addressing the employees, he turned to my father and bowed deeply. I really apologize for the inconvenience and thank you for considering my request. I will work with all my heart. The former employees, seeing Henry's respect, also showed their gratitude towards my father. Meanwhile, his parents were the only ones objecting. Don't be fooled. That man ruined the company and that woman encouraged him. Wake up to reality. You're struggling for jobs because the company was destroyed, right? Just because you're getting help doesn't mean you should forget the truth. Despite his parents' desperate pleas, everyone had already heard the truth from Henry. They completely ignored his parents. Even my father disregarded their complaints. When the former employees looked to him for reassurance, he promised to share more details later, and they left, relieved and thanking my father. After everyone had gone and it was quiet, his parents started fussing about their future. We're losing this house we used as collateral. We're going to be homeless. What are we supposed to do now? Henry sighed in exasperation at his parents who still tried to blame us. I had enough and finally said, I don't care what you think. You got what you deserved and it can't be helped. Why don't you show some remorse? I scolded them, but they didn't seem to listen. Unable to bear their persistence any longer, I lost my patience. Haven't you just caused trouble for Henry all this time? 
boasting about being business owners and only caring about titles? Isn't that why all this happened? Upon hearing my words, his parents looked like they were ready to argue back, implying that I was being rude. But then my father stepped in firmly, indicating he wouldn't let them speak further. A business owner is supposed to take responsibility. You should at least complete your final task properly, he said. Left speechless by our collective scolding, his parents could say nothing more. We left them behind and walked away. Eventually, his parents lost everything the company, the house, the land. They never provided any guarantees to the former employees and avoided taking responsibility. After losing everything, they were caught for deceit and dashing. When Henry's parents reached out to him for help, Henry, having cut ties with them, coldly turned them away. They're probably in jail now. We've heard nothing from them since. Even if they get out, they still owe debts to the former employees, so their situation hasn't changed. Afterward, Henry and I quit our jobs and joined my father's company. We lived off our savings in the first month, working for free as promised. One day at work, we met a former employee from his parents' company. This person rushed over to us, eager to shake our hands and express their gratitude to my father for giving them a job, to Henry for arranging it, and surprisingly to me. I didn't remember, but apparently, I had helped that person with some materials soon after they joined the company. After expressing immense gratitude and a desire to keep working hard, the former employee left. Feeling somewhat redeemed by his words, we hurried to my father's office. He welcomed us warmly and pulled out several thick envelopes from his desk drawer, handing them to us. What's this, Dad? I asked. It's your salaries for the past months. It ended up being multiple envelopes because it couldn't all fit into one, he said with a laugh. We were stunned. It hadn't been many months, and with all the new employees hired, it seemed impossible for us to have earned this much. Yet here he was, giving us our salaries. We were taken aback and couldn't quite believe it, but my father continued, Your hard work revitalized the team. They constantly expressed their gratitude and concern for you. I couldn't leave such excellent employees unpaid, especially since our performance had improved so much. Hearing this, we humped each other and cried. We had been so focused on our tasks that we hadn't realized the impact we had made. But even more than that, we were touched by the concern shown for us. Then my father added something even more wonderful. Henry, I'm impressed with your leadership. If you're okay with it, would you marry my daughter? Yes, yes, of course. I'm honored and grateful, Henry replied tearfully, bowing to me and my father. I hugged Henry, crying alongside him. And so, we got married. We continued working at my father's company, living happily every day. Gradually, we became more skilled at our jobs, contributing even more effectively. This allowed us to discuss production efficiency and new ideas with my father. Henry was also busy, visiting the factories and subsidiaries to ensure everything ran smoothly. He was constantly proposing solutions and suggesting the implementation of new systems. We were more passionate about our work than ever before, finding true fulfillment in our work. However, our time at the company was about to take a brief pause. I was about to go on maternity leave. My father, Henry, our colleagues, and I were all looking forward to the arrival of our child. 